Welcome to 10th episode of Curiosity. It's indeed a milestone that I never imagined that this Curiosity will reach 10th episode, uh, to be honest with you all. Thanks a lot for your support. What did I learn in the week number 30th of 2020? That is what this episode is all about. We are going to cover a lot of subjects across the disciplines as usual. Black hole, dementia, obesity, relationship, lying, profitability of welfare schemes, Denbar number in gorillas, phylogeny of novel coronavirus, masks, and naked more rats. So keep watching for another exciting show. Our first story of the week is about insatiable hunger. You might know the character. This character is in Ramayana, the Hindu epic, and uh, his name was. Uh, can you remember? Uh, he is Kumbhakarna. You know, synonym of great hunger. So this is the story is about uh, this famous picture. You might know that it's a last year's picture, one of the iconic figure. Uh, this is by the Event Horizon uh, Telescope. Uh, you know, this is a black hole. Event Horizon, by the way, is of course is the name of telescope, but also it means that the last, uh, you know, the periphery of the uh, black hole, and beyond that you will be engulfed by the, you know, the gravitational pull of the black hole. So this is a new paper. Uh, of the quasar. So the, the, the first story is about the quasar. It's one of the new paper. So the what is quasar by the way? Quasar is quasi-stellar radio source. So it's basically detected by the radio uh, telescopes, not really optical telescopes, you know. So it's extremely bright objects powered by the black holes at least a billion times as massive as our sun. So it's super massive, uh, you know, uh, uh, structures uh, in the universe. You know, that is what you call the quasar. So it's basically detected by the radio telescopes. So black hole acts like an extremely powerful natural particle accelerator. Of course, it's a particle accelerator. So uh, nearby the black hole, you will see an extremely bright objects and uh, objects that, uh, you know, give rise to a lot of radio uh, waves. Uh, that is why the quasars are being formed. So the first story of the week is a paper published last week uh, in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, a very well-known journal. The title of the paper is a 34 billion solar mass black hole in SMSS J2157-3602, the most luminous non-quasar. And the study is uh, uh, written by a team of uh, scientists from Australia, Chile and US. So the paper is all about the scientists have come across a large black hole with a gargantuan appetite just like our Kumbhakarna, you know. And each passing day, the insatiable void known as J2157 consumes gas and dust equivalent to the mass of sun. So each day it eats up the sun. Can you imagine it? It's a super massive black hole friends, making it the fastest growing black hole in the universe. So it's a major discovery. So J2167 is 8,000 times more massive than the supermassive black hole found in the heart of the Milky Way. Yes, in our galaxy, the heart of the Milky Way, there is a very massive, uh, you know, the black hole. And uh, uh, that black hole is something called Sagittarius A. So that's equivalent to 34 billion times the mass of the sun, the newly discovered, uh, you know, the black hole. So in the order for the Sagittarius A, the Milky Way supermassive black hole to reach such a similar size of uh, the newly discovered one, it would have to have to gobble two thirds of all stars in the galaxy. Look at that, how big the new discovery is all about. If the Sagittarius A can able to gobble the eat up uh, two third of the entire mass in the entire universe, then that will reach the same uh, mass as that of the, the newly discovered uh, J2157. You know, it's really big. And a quote from the paper, we are seeing it at a time when the universe was only 1.2 billion years old. Look at that. It was really young. As of now, it is around 13 to 14 billion years old. You know, so it's less than 10 percentage of its current age. We are looking at a very young universe by looking at that, uh, uh, the black hole. We really don't know what has ha actually happened to the black hole. Uh, you know, so it will take a really long time to see the current status of the black hole billions of uh, years from now, isn't it? So this is a picture of the uh, the Sagittarius A, uh, the, the black hole in the center of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. 
and this is the uh, telescope the structure the four main uh, astronomical telescopic unit observatory and that is what i call the, the very large telescope of the european space organization eso it has been installed at atacama desert in chile and uh, this is where uh, this facility has been used for uh, you know detecting this uh, supermassive black hole so amazing work ESO and I'm also quite happy to note that the science progresses through this kind of international collaborative work uh, you see that it's actually in the Chile but it's managed by the European Space Organization uh, such kind of international collaborative research is way to go for the future of the humanity and this planet earth so our second story of the week is a paper published in the Lancet the title of the paper is dementia prevention intervention and the care 2020 report of the Lancet Commission. The paper is authored by a team from University College London in the UK. By the way, the, the term dementia is a collective term used to describe various symptoms of the cognitive decline, such as forgetfulness, you know, amnesia. So that is only one uh, subset of the dementia. So dementia is a really complicated and multifaceted disease. So according to this paper, the paper actually added three more uh, risk factors for the dementia. What are these factors? Excessive alcohol consumption, head injury and air pollution. Air pollution is a, a major risk factor for dementia friends. So to our 2017 Lancet Commission on Dementia Prevention, Intervention and Care, uh, life course model of the nine factors. So other life, uh, the nine factors which we already know include less education, hypertension, hearing impairment, smoking, obesity, depression, physical inactivity, diabetes and infrequent social contact or loneliness you know all these are non risk factors for dementia but now that we have three more risk factors including alcohol consumption head injury and air pollution so another good reason to stop uh, you know alcohol consumption altogether also if you are a smoker to quit smoking and if you are a sedentary person go out for uh, you know biking or running you know be active that's one of the very effective prevention uh, scenarios uh, you know to prevent uh, the development of the dementia later in uh, the life a quote from the paper is while some actions can be taken on a personal level to tackle such issues many require government led change we are expecting by 2050 that two thirds of people with dementia if trajectories continue will be in low income countries so the issue with the low income countries is the air is really polluted for example uh, paddy uh, you know burning the the residue burning is really common in this part of the country uh, you know in Punjab where I live uh, especially during the Diwali time the, 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 the residue burning is really intoxicating the whole air around so unless the, at the personal level we cannot do anything unless the government acts into it you know and uh, uh, that is the only way out you know so the individual level prevention uh, it's not possible in many of these things of course there are so many things that we can actually do that for example alcohol consumption we can at, at the individual level we can stop it head injury by wearing uh, helmets uh, and uh, uh, but the air pollution of course uh, you know that really need a government intervention our next story of the week the third story is uh, uh, you know a paper published in journal of alzheimer's disease by a u.s team the title of the paper is patterns of regional cerebral blood flow as a a function of obesity in adults. Uh, the study included 35,000 adults. So this study's principal conclusion is that higher body mass index, that is BMI, is linked to decreased cerebral blood flow, which is associated with increased risk of Alzheimer's disease and mental illness. So, you know, the obesity is again coming in picture here for the development of, or a, rather a risk factor for uh, Alzheimer's disease. So one of the largest studies linking obesity with the brain dysfunction. Scientists analyzed over 35,000 functional neuroimaging scans, you know. So low cerebral blood flow, that is the blood flow onto your cerebrum, uh, is the number one brain imaging predictor that a person will develop Alzheimer's disease. It's also associated with a depression, then attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, that is ADHD, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, traumatic brain injury, 
addiction suicide and other conditions so you know if your uh, if your bmi is very high then better to control it you know even a weekly fasting uh, is a, a very good option or intermittent fasting is another better option i've covered many of these uh, topics in my channel previously about uh, you know the, the the benefits of intermittent fasting as well as uh, weekly fasting here is an image uh, from the paper so as you can see that the graph the the y-axis is the baseline hippocampus perfusion or rather you know the, the blood flow in the cerebrum and y-axis is different kind of uh, groups as you can see the underweight is pretty high while normal weight or overweight obese and morbidly obese as you can see that the pattern is really decreasing the blood flow is really decreasing and this is what exactly you can see it here as well you know this is uh, adequate uh, bomb you know uh, normal bmi people have got adequate uh, blood flow but as you can see that overweight and obese the blood flow became hampered you know that is exactly what this image is also saying so another good reason to check your bmi if your bmi is more than the upper limit of the bmi that is 25 then it's much better to control your uh, you know the weight there's going to be a very important stepping stone towards minimizing risk of developing alzheimer's disease in the later in your life our fourth story of the week is entitled the machine learning uncovers the most robust self-report predictors of relationship quality across 43 longitudinal couples studies uh, the article has been published in pnas by u.s canadian and israeli team uh, it is a longitudinal study in, in that you know that actually spanned for 20 years and it included 11196 couples so it's a massive study so a study on 11196 couples shows that it's not the person you choose but the relationship you build that matters so how you build the relationship rather than whom you choose to marry or to be with you know that matters more so the finding is going to have ramifications on dating apps like tinder or okcupid uh, the way the algorithms work or even matrimonial sites uh, it's very common here in india for example bharatmatrimony.com you know so or the cost based matrimonial sites so those variables that are related to the couple's dynamic predicted success in relationship more reliably than individual personality traits. So it's not really that whom you are actually uh, choose to be with, but how you build the relationship. That's an, an excellent finding, you know, that is a, uh, in a way it is a common sense finding, but still, uh, you know, the empirical research have revealed it. So this is exactly what the statement says. The grass is greenest where you water it. You know, it's not that simply getting a nice lawn is not a solution, right? You have to maintain it. So that is exactly the, the relationship as well, you know. So another quote is that the, the fool chases happiness, but the wise man grows it under his feet or her feet, you know. So it is not the chasing happiness is the answer. We have to actually uh, cultivate the happiness by ourselves. Uh, yet another similar idea is that love is an action, not a feeling, uh, or love is a choice not a feeling or love is a verb not a noun you see the idea is exactly same but this new paper in pinas has uh, revealed it empirically over uh, you know a, a longitudinal study spanning 20 years yet another reason to get away from perfectionism when it comes to choosing the partner well too many people's relationships run on the warm feelings they have for each other early in a relationship and when the often hard reality of sharing your life with another person sets in the warm feeling isn't there and they decide oh i guess we weren't right for each other so cultivating the relationship matters a lot more than uh, choosing the perfect partner the fifth story of the week is entitled pathological lying uh, theoretical and empirical support for a diagnostic entity the paper is published in psychiatry research and clinical practice by a u.s team and the study included 650 cohorts and the participants of this study spanned a range of ages ethnicities education levels and income levels and uh, the principal conclusion of the study is that about 13 percentage of the people are pathological liars telling an average of 10 lies per day you see 10 lies they, they say every single day the study also found that the pathological liars were more likely to experience distress and impaired functioning especially in social relationships so if you keep on lying then you are a, a far more likely to experience you know the distress and uh, impaired functioning in social relationship 
uh, it's a revealing you know study this diminished functioning also applied to the legal context work and finances their distress often had to do with the worries about whether their lies would be discovered. So they are always in this quandary that, uh, you know, when these lies will be discovered. So they're not going to have, uh, you know, the peaceful life, you know, the tranquility of the life. Uh, that is a, a very interesting study. Our sixth story of the week is uh, something to do with the welfare scheme. Look at this illustration. It's a beautiful illustration by Lisa Hanley in the New York Times. So uh, the state is providing a support for those who need it. That is called the welfare scheme, isn't it? So uh, as we know, the welfare scheme is uh, pitted to be more for the socialistic countries, you know, or democratic political uh, conventions. They are, they are the one who is more likely to provide this kind of welfare scheme. Now, the welfare scheme is many people, uh, especially rich people, think that the welfare scheme is actually simply wasting the taxpayers' money. Uh, it doesn't actually lead to any, anything, you know. And now the new paper has been published in the journal of Quarterly Journal of the Economics, a very well-known journal by a Harvard University team. And the, this, the study included 133 policy changes. They looked at the policy changes. And the title of the paper is that a unified welfare analysis of the government policy. So they analyze the government policies and the, the main conclusion is that these welfare schemes can be profitable. That's an eye opening uh, finding indeed friends. So social programs can sometimes turn a profit for the taxpayers. So the study by the two Howard economists found that many programs, especially those focused on children and young adults, made money for the taxpayers when all costs and benefits were factored in. So, you know, we have covered one such welfare scheme in earlier episode of the Curiosity uh, that was about a Head Start program in the US. And, um, you know, of course, it was found to be uh, really, really helpful for the needy people, you know. So that's because they've improved the health and education of the enrollees and their families who eventually earned more income and paid more taxes and uh, you know needed less government assistance overall. If you factor all of these things in, then definitely this welfare scheme, you know, social reform policies can be translated into huge revenues, you see. Well, the same conclusion can be applicable on many of these preventive uh, diseases as well. For example, uh, government insisting for wearing masks, you know, uh, that actually protects uh, people from catching the COVID-19. Uh, had the people got the COVID-19, then its impact on the state treasury would have been a lot serious, even GDP. So you're actually, the government is saving a lot of money by insisting people to wear masks. So it's the same concept can be applicable in uh, uh, preventing the infectious diseases as well. As we have already covered the Head Start program, it has shown for years that investing in early childhood education for kids in lower income brackets greatly decreases their likelihood to rely on public assistance as adults. So in other words, this is saving a lot of money from the treasury. While on the other hand, in the US, the system of the funding is quite strange. You know, schools in the US are funded by how wealthy the neighborhood is. If the neighborhood, uh, that means the cities or the townships are not wealthy, then the schools are getting much lesser funded. And if the neighborhood is quite wealthy, then the public schools are getting much better funded. So, and because of this practice, you know, that the schools are not really adequately funded in poorer areas. Our next story of the week is about friends and how many friends can you have? For example, this is my uh, Facebook. Uh, you can see that number of friends is 4,983. I keep on deleting some friends so that I give a buffer, you know, to add a few more friends. So I have around 5,000 friends that is the upper limit of the Facebook. So do, are these all my friends? No, not at all. Previous studies have shown that around 150 is upper limit of anybody's uh, friends in their life. That uh, The number is called Dunbar number. I'll come to it in a short while. So our seventh story of the week is about the social complexity. Uh, the title of the paper is comparing measures of social complexity. Larger mountain gorilla groups do not have a greater diversity of relationships. So this paper was published last week in the journal called Proceedings of the Royal Society B biological sciences. Uh, this is by a team from Rwanda, that is the uh, African country, and the UK. It's a longitudinal study, spans 12 years, and included 13 gorilla groups. 
The principal conclusion of this study is that the study of 13 more mountain gorilla groups over 12 years finds that as social groups get larger, most relationships become distant with a few close ties. It's exactly like uh, the Facebook, you know, out of my 5,000 uh, odd friends, I usually don't talk to any of these. So that is exactly what is happening in gorilla as well, uh, an exciting study. So the pattern mirrors what happens in human social circles and suggests that the gorillas have a limit to the close ties uh, they maintain. So how, you know, how big the limit is so that there is actually a limit. So the, that limit for human being is a Dunbar number that is around 150 uh, people. Uh, perhaps the same number applies to the gorillas also. We really have no clue. And also this finding also have got ramifications on the evolution of language concern because the theory is that the humans develop the language because of the issues with cross communicating between the groups as groups become larger and larger. So earlier the, the group used to have only 150 the tribes. You know, now that, you know, as the groups become larger and larger, we really need to invent uh, a language. So that is how the language is developed. That is what a historical linguists say. The finding also adds growing evidence for striking similarities between human and gorilla social networks. Our eighth story of the week is about the coronavirus, the origin of the coronavirus. It's a paper published in Nature Microbiology by US and UK team. The title of the paper is Evolutionary Origins of SARS-CoV-2 Sarbica Virus Lineage Responsible for COVID-19 Pandemic. The principal conclusion of the study is that the lineage that give rise to the virus has been circulating in bats for decades and likely includes other viruses with the ability to infect human beings. Uh, earlier, we discussed in curiosity that uh, on average two spillover events per year has been happening for the last one century due to the wildlife trade and deforestation. So this current study did a, a great phylogenetic uh, assessment including a time calibrated phylogeny and the conclusion of this study is that divergent dates between SARS-CoV-2 and that the bat SARS-CoV-2 virus reservoir were estimated as 1948 at 95 percentage highest uh, posterior density or HPD you know so that is basically 1879 to 1999 1969 at uh, 95 percent HPD ranges between uh, 1930 to 2000 and 1982 with the 95 percent HPD ranges between 1948 to 2009 this indicates that the lineage giving rise to the SARS-CoV-2 has been circulating unnoticed in bats for decades. Is this something new? Not really. If you go back in time, way back in 2015, there is a paper published in Nature Medicine. Uh, you know, the, the title of the paper is that a SARS-like cluster of circulating bat coronavirus shows potential for human emergence. And the study's first author is an uh, Indian origin scientist in the US, Vinid D. Manacheri, you know, and uh, published in Nature Medicine way back in 2015. And that's it. No, if we go still back in time, this is another very important paper, a landmark publication indeed. Uh, the title is Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus as an Agent of Emerging and Re-Emerging Infection published in Clinical Microbiology Reviews in October 2007 by a Chinese team. If you look at the abstract carefully, uh, the final sentence of that abstract, let me read out. The presence of a large reservoir of SARS-CoV like viruses in horseshoe bats together with the culture of eating exotic mammals in southern China is a time bomb. I repeat, it's a time bomb. The authors said that way back in 2007, friends. Our ninth story of the week is also about coronavirus. Uh, it's published in the journal Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report of the CDC, that is Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the US government uh, by the US team. And the study included uh, 133 cohorts. So the study is a really interesting study. So among 139 clients exposed to two symptomatic hair stylists with confirmed COVID-19, while both the stylist and the clients wore face masks, no symptomatic secondary cases were reported. Look at that. This is the first such report when both of them were wearing masks, you know, the hairstylist and the clients. 
you know, see that 139 clients came to that same hairstylist. Both the stylists had, uh, you know, symptomatic COVID-19. And because they both won the, uh, you know, the, the face mask, not a single person out of 139 got COVID-19. Look at the efficacy of the mask is underlined by this study. This is the strongest evidence uh, till date that the mask protects. So as stay at home orders are lifted, professional and social interactions in the community will present more opportunities for the spread of SARS-CoV-2. Broader implementation of the face covering policies could mitigate spread of infection in the general population. The statement is taken from the paper. Our 10th story of the week is about animals. If you had asked me which is my favorite animal, I would have answered that this animal can you tell me uh, this, which is the name of this animal this is a very very famous animal and uh, uh, probably this is uh, you know this animal is known as the toughest creature on earth you know uh, because uh, if you can boil them or freeze them uh, you, you can try to drown or expose to radiation nothing is going to happen simply shrug and this critter is a favorite model organism of the astrobiologists or exobiologists you know People looking for the life in other planet. Yes, this creature is known as tardigrade. Well, our 10th story of the week is not exactly about tardigrade, but also a similar extremophile animal. Uh, look at this animal. Any guess what is this animal known as? This, this cute animal is known as naked mole rat or heterocephalus glabber. Naked mole rat is the only extremophile mammal in the world and it's really, really curious animal, friends. It rarely ever get cancer, you know, so it is actually a, a model organism for the cancer biologist. It's also extremely resistant to the pain and also they don't even get age, you know, at the risk of death doesn't go up as they grow older. Usually in animals, especially in mammals like us, uh, human beings, when we get older, the risk of dying or so get significantly increased, isn't it? But that is not the case with uh, these animals, you know. So that is why uh, the naked mole rat is a model system for gerontology research. Uh, gerontology is a subject concerned with aging. And uh, we also know that uh, this naked mole rat can survive up to 18 minutes of no oxygen. Look, this is a mammal. We don't know any mammal that can live that long without oxygen. All these are non-fact. Now, what is actually about our latest paper that is the 10th story of the week? It's a paper published in Current Biology last week and the title of the paper is Nest Carbon Dioxide Masks GABA Dependent Seizure Susceptibility in the Naked Mole Rat. Uh, this is by US Finnish team. The paper's main conclusion is that when this naked mole rat don't get enough CO2, they have seizures. So the carbon dioxide is actually a key to a creature's health and well-being. It's not that simply they can uh, live in a high carbon dioxide conditions, but more importantly, they need high carbon dioxide environment for their life and well-being. When the rats reach the fresh, oxygen-rich air of the outdoors, their minds start to race, which can bring on seizures and encourage them not to venture too far from the crowded burrows. So maybe this is an adaptation, who knows? When they are in their crowded burrows in the close proximity with other naked mole rat, then the oxygen level is less and CO2 level is much higher because they exhale the CO2, isn't it? So, you know, they, they want to live in the, the packed uh, community. Of course, these are you social animals. The researchers were able to track down the cause of carbon dioxide dependency to a common genetic variant that is SNP called uh, R952H which in turn affects the KCC2 protein that is responsible for regulating the amount of chloride in the brain's neurons. And what are the ramifications of this finding? Of course, it lights up the whole therapeutic landscape of febrile seizures, idiopathic generalized epilepsy, uh, schizophrenia and autism. Indeed, such curiosity-driven research has got huge ramifications from, uh, you know, it's a very famous quote uh, that is by, uh, you know, J.B.S. Haldane in his famous book, What is Life? Uh, the universe is not only queerer than we imagine, but queerer than we can ever imagine. Look at that. It's really, really strange. These kind of critters throw up, uh, you know, very important topics in the medical research. And uh, yeah, if you haven't read yet, What is Life is a wonderful book by J.B.S. Haldane. And there is another book by another famous, uh, you know, scientist, the same title, What is Life? Uh, do you, uh, any guesses? 
Yes, it's by Erwin Schrodinger. Uh, Schrodinger's What is Life is yet another strongly recommended book available easily available on Amazon. Uh, please go and check it out in your local library also, right? Hope you like this show. If you like this show, please click thumbs up, subscribe to my channel and share it in relevant groups. I will see you soon in next week. Until then, goodbye.